Hello, and welcome to part two of Arcadia University's BI 327 Histology Lecture on Bone. And in part two, we're going to take a look at bone organization. Now, again, thinking about this as a three-dimensional structure, thinking about it as a gross anatomical structure, what we're going to start out with is take a look at the outer surface of the bone. And the outer surface of bone is going to be called the periosteum. Peri for around, os for bone. So it's going to be the structure that's going to be around the bone. If we take a look at this, uh, the periosteum is going to be located on all regions of the bone, on the outer surface of bone, everywhere except for the articular surfaces. And so, again, the articular surfaces are where two bone structures come together, uh, essentially within a joint cavity, allowing for them to essentially move in relationship to one another. And so again, we're going to have a hyaline cartilage on the articular surfaces because we need those properties so we have smooth movement of the bone within the joint. Now the periosteum, if we take a look at it, is essentially going to be uh, a connective tissue region that's going to be involved primarily with allowing the bone to become connected to the surrounding tissues. You know, we don't want a skeleton that's going to be loose and the, the, the outer skin and the other structures kind of moving kind of freely around it. We need it to be anchored to it. And so what we're going to see is that similar to what we had with the perichondrium, the region around the connective tissue, in the periosteum, we're going to have this outer surface, and there are going to be two uh, distinct layers. Now, the first layer is going to be the osteogenic layer, os for bone, genic for birth. Uh, so we're going to be looking at the region, which is capable of producing bone cells if necessary. So we're going to see a finer, looser connective tissue in that osteogenic layer, essentially right on that external surface of the bone. And in this place, we're going to have some bone precursor cells. Uh, they may not even be osteoblasts. The osteoblasts, the builder cells, they may be uh, osteogenic stem cells. They can be cells that are essentially sitting there waiting for a signal. And if they receive that signal, they're going to differentiate and become osteoblasts. They're going to differentiate, become the cells that are going to produce bone and eventually become bone cells. So they're there, in essence, as a reserve. Uh, outside of that, outside of the osteogenic layer, we're going to have the fibrous layer. And the fibrous layer is going to be a dense connective tissue layer, which is going to, again, provide a kind of a coating around the external surface of the bone. Uh, but it's also going to serve as the attachment site for tendons and ligaments and other connective tissues to hold the rest of the body attached to our skeleton, attached to this bony structure. Now, when we take a look at it in very, very fine detail, what we're going to see are Sharpie's fibers. Sharpie's fibers are going to be these perpendicular collagen fibers that essentially come out of the bone matrix itself and then extend into the periosteum and then become interwoven and interacting with the fibrous layer of that dense connective tissue. And so these Sharpie's fibers, these collagen fibers, are essentially going to go through uh, the bone matrix itself they're going to be calcified, they're going to be anchored in that, and they're going to allow then this periosteum to remain attached to the outer surface of the bone. Now moving to the opposite side, so the innermost region of the bone, we're going to see an endosteum, in for inside, osteum for bone. So we're looking at the inside surface of the bone. And instead of that outer uh, relatively thick connective tissue, dense connective tissue on the outside, we're going to find a very thin connective tissue, a very uh, fragile, in essence, connective tissue uh, associated with the inner surface of the bone. And it's going to be a specialized connective tissue in that we're going to be looking at a reticular connective tissue. So again, looking at this as almost like a little jungle gym, in essence, that's found along the internal surfaces of the bone, uh, especially within the marrow cavities. And so we're going to find the endosteum uh, lining the marrow cavities, and it's also going to extend into structures we're going to talk about in a couple minutes, which are going to be the herversion canals, the larger structures that are going to be found within the bone itself. Now, within the endosteum, within the marrow cavities, we can either have red bone marrow or yellow bone marrow. Red bone marrow is, we're going to, we're going to see lots of uh, nucleated cells, lots of cells that are going to be involved with hematopoiesis, uh, bone formate, I'm sorry, blood cell formation. Hematopoiesis is blood cell formation. And so we're going to be looking at that in some locations. Other locations in the marrow cavity, we're essentially going to have fat cells. And if we have the fat cells, we're going to see that chicken wire appearance. And we're going to have a region that's going to be referred to as yellow bone marrow. 
Now, if we take a look at bone organization, in essence, from a three-dimensional structure, almost like a, a gross anatomical structure, uh, the first way we can take a look at bone is to look at it as either spongy bone or cancellous bone. And again, we're looking at this as a three-dimensional gross anatomical structure. And so what we see in spongy bone is essentially this lattice work with lots of open spaces. So it's almost like the little jungle gym type structure uh, when we talk about the reticular connective tissue, but at a much larger level. So you can see this in essence uh, uh, almost at the gross anatomical level. So you can see portions of this with your naked eye without uh, the need for a microscope. So you've got this three-dimensional lattice, many open spaces, and the bone structure itself are going to be trabeculi and spicules. Um, not a whole lot of difference between the two, uh, but essentially different structures uh, that can be found within the bone. And now it's important to keep in mind that these trabeculi and spicules, these structures within the spongy bone, can be composed of either primary or secondary bone. And we'll talk about those in a couple minutes as well. Uh, but that's another way of categorizing different types of bone. Now we can find the spongy, I'm sorry, yeah, the uh, spongy bone structures in the, the large uh, bulbous ends of uh, mature long bones, so the epiphysius. We can find it at the core of short bones, and we can also find it in between thick plates, uh, like uh, the tables or the flat skull bones. So it's, again, it's going to be filling up some of the bone structure. Uh, it's going to be relatively open, so it's going to be a lighter form of bone. Uh, but the orientation of this is going to be along kind of the stress points. So it's still going to be providing a lot of bone strength. The second type of bone organization, again, at the gross anatomical level, is compact bone. And compact bone is also called dense bone or cortical bone. So it lacks the large spaces and the trabeculi that we see in spongy bone, uh, but it's going to be this denser kind of packed in bone. And this is always composed of secondary bone. And we'll talk about what primary and secondary bone is in a couple minutes. Now, we can find compact bone or dense bone in the thick diaphysial cylinders of the long bones, the outer covering of the long bones, uh, the shaft of the long bones in essence, the, the covering over the epiphysis, and so there's the covering over the bulbous ends, as well as the tables of the flat skull bones. So again, this denser type of bone structure is going to be the compact bone. The other type of looking at bone organization is at the, the micro level, essentially at the, the histological level in essence. And the first is going to be primary bone. And primary bone is going to be a woven or an immature bone. And so this is going to be the type of bone that we see with new bone formation or new bone formation after damage. So we're going to see this in repair of fractures. So uh, if we break a bone, this is the type of bone that's going to be forming first. Now the collagen fibers are not going to form the concentric rings, and we're going to talk about the concentric rings in a minute uh, with the next type of bone, uh, secondary bone. Uh, but essentially what we're going to see is that the collagen fibers have an irregular or woven appearance. Now we know from when we talked about connective tissue that it's not random. These fibers are going to be woven together, giving them strength in a lot of different orientations. And so we've got some strength there. Uh, because of this three-dimensional woven pattern of these type 1 collagen fibers. Now primary bone is going to be less mineralized than secondary bone and the reason for that is that we're going to have lots of osteocytes there, we're going to have a higher osteocyte to matrix ratio, so we're going to have lots of these uh, bone cells in essence packed in more closely together uh, than what we'd find in secondary bone. And so again this is a, uh, an immature in essence form of bone. Now, what's going to happen is that this primary bone, this immature bone, is going to be replaced over time with secondary bone, lamellar bone, a uh, bone that has essentially concentric rings and concentric layers where we're going to have this nice three-dimensional structure, dense bone structure, which is going to provide a lot of strength along the axis of these structures. And so secondary bone, lamellar bone, is going to appear as dense, packed, bony cylinders. And these bony cylinders are going to be referred to as aversion systems or osteomes. And so if we take a look at this, and again, looking at this in either ground bone or uh, demineralized bone, we see the same basic structure. We're going to see an opening in the center, and that opening is going to be the aversion canal. Uh, within the aversion canal, we're going to have uh, an endosteum lined cavity with lymphatic and blood vessels and nerves coming up with this to supply the cells within that region.
And so what we're going to have is that traversion canal, and then surrounding that, we're going to have concentric layers of bone, which are going to be laid down in these layers. Osteocytes, the, os the, the bone cells, are going to be found between these layers, again, supporting and maintaining the bone structure itself. So if we take a look at this at much higher magnification, we can see, again, that central traversion canal. We can see the layers of bone going around it, and we're going to refer to it as lamellae. Lamellae are going to be concentric layers of collagen fibers, and they appear like little, uh, almost like little tree rings. Uh, so if we're going to cut down a tree, and you can see the growth rings. We can see the lamellae as concentric layers of bone around that central herversion canal. The osteocytes are going to be sitting within lacunae in rows, in essence, at each of these junctions between the lamellae. And then we can see these relatively thin canaliculi, which are going to be canals through the bone, where these osteocytes, the bone cells, are going to extend their filopodia, extend their cytoplasmic processes, so that they essentially connect up with osteocytes that are closer to the reversion canal. And those are going to connect up ultimately with uh, the structures within the reversion canal so that they can pick up oxygen, they can pick up nutrients, carry it through its cytoplasm, extend it through the filopodia, and then transfer that to the cells deeper within the bone matrix itself, to the lamellae that are further away from uh, the central reversion canal. Now, if we take a look at this again, taking the structure and taking a look at it a little bit of the, the three-dimensional kind of gross anatomical structure, we've got the reversion canals, which are nice because they're running along the long axis of the bone, and they're going to be surrounded by these concentric layers of uh, bone, the concentric layers, uh, concentric lamellae of uh, collagen fibers. We're also going to have Volkmann's canals. Volkmann's canals are going to look exactly like the reversion canals, except that they're going to extend perpendicular to the reversion canals. And this is where we're going to have vascular connections, uh, blood vessels, nerves, and lymphatic vessels, they're going to be connecting up between adjacent reversion systems. And so because of that, because they're running perpendicular to the reversion system, you're going to find them cutting across the lamellae. So you're not going to have the concentric tree rings around it. What you're going to have are them cutting across the lamellae. Uh, you're also going to find, if you take a look at a lot of regions within the bone, is either interstitial lamellae, and interstitial lamellae are essentially these uh, layers that don't appear to be in nice concentric, almost like little tree rings. And these are going to be remnants of old osteones. And so they're going to be essentially portions of old structures that have been eroded away uh, and the intervening space has been replaced by a new uh, reversion system. And around the outside of the bone, the outer surface of the bone, uh, or the inner surface of the bone, we can also find circumferential lamellae. And so these, are, again, are going to be layers of collagen, layers of bone. They're going to be wrapped around the entire structure of the bone, wrapped around the uh, kind of internal region, uh, the inner surface, uh, that are running not really within our aversion system, but are running in a structure around the gross anatomical structure of the bone itself. And that's going to finish up the mini lecture on the discussion of bone organization. Uh, as always, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu. Thanks, and I'll see you in part three of this lecture.